come and open the book and preach to us. Thank you very much, Brother Smith. Appreciate you. Amen. Well, if you'll take your Bibles and go to 1 Kings chapter number 18, it is an honor to be able to be here, and I want to say to Pastor Morrison a, a huge thank you. You know, I think every preacher would be uh, benefited to come and just study this man and this church when it comes to their spirit of hospitality and their kindness to those of us that have come in. And uh, thank you so much. It's an honor to preach behind your pulpit, and I appreciate this opportunity. I love Dr. Smith and uh, appreciate so much the influence of the sword of the Lord. My mom and dad was not saved until they were 26 years of age. I was born into the family of a, of a lost couple, and um, we were saved in an American Baptist church. Dad was called to preach in an American Baptist church, and it was because of the sword of the Lord and us receiving that. And uh, Oliver B. Green, Dad used to listen to him going back and forth to work. You get the sword of the Lord and Oliver B. Green, you're going to get corrupted. I'm just telling you. And uh, my dad said, Oliver B. Green, sword of the Lord, and King James Holy Bible, if you'll just stick with those three, you'll become an independent fundamental Baptist. And so, but uh, we owe them a debt. And uh, I appreciate Brother Smith, and I appreciate so much his steadfastness and um, also his kind spirit. Because I think he demonstrates to all of us that we can take strong stands, and we need to take strong stands. We're going to preach a little bit about that this morning. But we can also do it in a gracious manner, and he's been a, a blessing. I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Godsey and Brother Harper, so I'm going, to, I'm going to get into the message so I can get out of their way. I've needed this conference, and I want to say thank you to everyone who's prayed. Even up to two months ago, I wasn't even sure I would be able to be here, and I took off, told my wife, I appreciate the opportunity to preach. I really mean that. But honestly, more than that, I just felt like I needed to park myself somewhere for a while. And so I came in on Monday. I'll fly out on Friday morning. I just need to sit here preaching. And uh, every one of you men that's preached thus far have been a huge blessing to me and a huge help to me. And you talked about that altar time. You know, I needed a little of that, too. It's helped me. And so thank you, everyone, for your prayers and uh, your support during this time. First Kings chapter number 18, we'll begin in verse number one. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show thyself unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly for it it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all the fountains of water and to all the brooks, preadventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he said unto him, I am, go tell thy Lord. Look at this next statement. Behold, Elijah is here. Behold, Elijah is here. Jump down to verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Lord, help us, Lord. I pray that you be an encouragement to your preachers this morning, dear God. Holy Spirit, assist us as we evaluate where we stand and where we are and what we need to be and what we need to do. And Lord, I pray that you'll help me. Lord, give me physical strength and mental focus. And Lord, above all, a touch of the power of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of us are very familiar with the story of this chapter and all that it contains. This chapter 
tells a story. It's a true story. It's a classic story of confrontation and conflict and Christian courage. I love this. I love to, from time to time, just turn to this chapter and walk beside Elijah up Mount Carmel. This is a story of good versus evil. This is the story of God versus Baal, of prevailing prayer versus vain repetition, of fire versus fake. It's a story of slain bullocks and stone altars and screaming, slashing madmen and, and a deaf, false deity. And, and I like this, a sarcastic, taunting preacher. <laughs> it's the story of 12 barrels of wet water and a 63-word prayer and, and then a miracle. A miracle that came straight from the throne of God. A miracle of fire that splits the skies and falls with such power that it vexes and vaporizes an altar and all that it contains. By the time the story is finished, there's nothing left. Nothing but a humiliated king. Nothing but a prostrate and repentant people. Nothing but a blood splashed weary prophet stand, standing beside a pile of decapitated heads. And, and by the way, there's one more thing that remains at the end of this story. The air is thick with one final unmistakable message, and this is that message. God always wins. God always wins. Now this morning we're not going to make it to the top of the mountain. This message will focus on the first 20 verses of the chapter will uh, focus on the four types of prophets that we are introduced to in these verses. Please pray for me as I preach on the four prophets, the four prophets of Mount Carmel. Let's get right into it. And by the way, let's allow the Holy Spirit to help put us in a slot this morning, to warn us if we're sliding and drifting even just a bit. Let's let this message just kind of be one of those reset buttons that make sure we go home being what we need to be and standing where we need to stand. The first type of prophet, by the way, I hate to even use that word to identify them, are the counterfeit prophets. We read about them in verse 19 and 20. They are the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the grove. The, who are these men? Well, they're the Joel Olsteins and the John Pipers and the Joyce Myers of their day. They are the pretenders and the posers and the phony prophets found in every generation. These are men and women who mount pulpits every Lord's Day, all claiming, all claiming to represent God as they misrepresent His Word. These are the 125 so-called clergy who two years ago during the battle in Indiana to add a traditional marriage amendment to our state constitution. Think about this. 125 counterfeit clergy showed up at the state house with a signed petition urging our governor to embrace and accept the sodomite lifestyle. And they dared call themselves preachers and prophets. We, found, we find counterfeit prophets in 1 Kings chapter 18. These 850 misfits dare take upon themselves the title of a prophet. They profane the office. They claim divine knowledge while leading people to eternal damnation. We should not be shocked. The Bible is filled with razor-edge warnings about false prophets. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, for such are false apostles, de deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Listen, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. In Jude, we are warned that in the last days there will be many false ministers, false teachers, and God addresses them in no uncertain terms. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and are perished in the gainsaying of Kor. He calls them spots in your feast, clouds without rain, carried about of winds, trees without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And I'm done with this group of prophets. 
I have nothing in common with them. Go join your ministerial association if you want to. Hobnob with that group if you want to. But I don't want to have anything to do with them. They have, we have nothing in common. So let's take them off the stage. Let's get them out of the auditorium. We're done with them. Off the end of the parking lot. Off the property. We've given them way too much time already. But don't hobnob with that group. Second group of prophets I'll identify it as the cowardly prophets. I find them at the end, mentioned at the end of verse 3 and 4. It says there that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Now folks, listen to me. I don't believe for one minute since bread and water is being uh, toted to this group that the news of this confrontation is not also carried to this group. Folks, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's what I grew up understanding. But apparently when the go going got tough here, the cowards headed into the cave. These are the preachers who are dipping their sails and quieting their voices and hiding in their studies while the nation is going to hell in a handbasket. There's too many of us that are dwelling in the cave. There's a confrontation taking place on a mountain. And where are these young preacher boys? Think about this. I got a call the other day from a man who'd been listening to some of my sermons online and he began to exhort me, another preacher, and said, Brother Jerry, we have to be careful what we're saying. I don't understand that. About three months ago, I got a, another call. We put everything that, I put everything I preach online. I mean, you go to our church website, you can hear Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And he said, Brother Jerry, a lot of us are taking our sermons off the internet because if we're not careful, one of these days when things really go bad, they're going to use that against you. And I thought to myself, what, what's going on here? Let me tell you something. That when the sodomites came out of the closet, they didn't shut the door. They left it open. And they're trying to make us go into the closet. Well, forgive my southern Indiana grammar, but I ain't going in no closet. We've got too many preachers that are hiding in the cave. There's a confrontation taking place on top of the mountain. Where are those hundred preacher boys? Hey, where's this young generation of preachers? I figured out one thing. They must have had a Wi-Fi connection in there because I think they're all in there making podcasts and, and, and posting criticisms of the old man that's walking up the mountain. They've never prayed down fire from heaven. They've never confronted anything in their life, but they're experts in criticizing those of us that have. Watch that old prophet walking up the hill. Can you picture it? I don't know where this cave was. I don't know if they were within a sight of what was happening, but I don't understand this part of the story. You know, I was, uh, I, there's a lot of things wrong with a young Jerry Ross. I'll just tell you that. I know me better than anybody knows me. And there was a lot of things wrong with a young Jerry Ross. But as a young preacher, I'm going to tell you something. My ra dad raised me in such a way that there's no way I'd have let that old man walk up that hill by himself. There's no way I'd have let him walk up there that hill by himself. I think there's a lot of Elijahs that's walking up the hill and they're, they're confronting some things that the rest of, the rest of the preachers won't do. And I think as he's climbing up that hill, can't you see from time to time just kind of stop to catch his breath? Because he's not as young as he used to be. Can't you see him maybe glancing down the hill behind him thinking, where are those boys? I mean, Elijah had influence on these young men, taught these young men, mentored these young men. And just when he needed them, where are they? Where are they? We need some young men that are going to walk. Let's stop criticizing the old men that are climbing up the mountain, taking stands you won't take. Why don't you run up and catch, a, catch up with them? I'd like to think if I was there, I would have run up and caught that old man. I said, I said, Brother Elijah, how are we doing? He said, Son, what are you doing here? Well, I thought I'd just take a walk. I'm just going to go where you're going to go. I'm just going to stand where you're going to stand. And I think Elijah might have looked at a young guy if he'd have had the courage to come with him and said, you know this, listen, we know how it ended. Elijah didn't know how it was going to end. Can you see him look at that young guy and say, well, you know, this might not end well. 
And I think maybe if it had been me, I'd look at that old preacher and say, well, it might not. But you know what? One thing's for sure. By the end of the day, we're going to have a story to tell. We may be telling it down here, or we may be telling it up there, but we're going to have a story to tell. Hey, young man, you got any stories to tell? You got any stories to tell? We're talking about the cowardly. Come on, the cowardly preachers. Think about that. It's one thing for the preachers not to stand, but the people wouldn't stand either. Verse 21, Elijah came unto all the people. Listen, the preachers, where are they? Where's the young preacher? Well, where's his own congregation at? How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. And if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. If you're blessed today, you're a church member, you're blessed to have a preacher that's willing to climb up on Mount Carmel. Don't you let him stand there by himself. When he's preaching the things that nobody else will preach, you let him hear those amens. You catch him at the back door. You hug his neck because you are blessed in this day and age if you have a preacher that still will open this King James Holy Bible and say, thus saith the Lord. So we have the counterfeit prophets. We have the cowardly prophets. Number three, we have the compromising prophets. Look at verse 3 through 6. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. And then we have these parentheses. And something nice is said about Obadiah there. He feared the Lord greatly. You say, Brother Ross, he, he wasn't all bad. I know that. I know it. I know it. My preacher daddy, my country preacher daddy used to say this. I'm not bothered by what most preachers are saying nowadays. What bothers me is not what they are saying. What bothers me is what they won't say. Now, come on, folks. You may come to me afterwards and try to defend Obadiah, but let me just say this. If you can make yourself at home in Ahab's house, then you're a compromiser. If you take a position as governor of Jezebel's house, then something's telling me you're not preaching some things that you ought to be preaching, amen. So I don't know, preacher, we'll look at verse 7 and 8. Let's listen to Elijah. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? You know, all of a sudden he wanted to act like Elijah was his Lord. Verse 8, and he answered in, I am. And then listen to what he said next. Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. You're not going to fool an old preacher. I'm a little disturbed by these young preachers who want to show up at a meeting like this and hobnob and act like they're us. But then, you know, two weeks later, they're hanging over with a different crowd. Come on, trying to play, play both sides of the fence. Why don't you decide where you're at and who you are? Why don't you stand there? Think about Obadiah. Obadiah was bought and paid for. Sorry. He no longer served the Lord. He wasn't a... Uh, uh, a cohort of Elijah, and the Lord was not his Lord. He was doing the bidding of a wicked king. Ahab gave him orders, and he said, yes, sir. He compromised for comfort and popularity, taking orders from Ahab while turning his back on the commandments of the Lord. Compromise. Compromise. It's everywhere. Compromise. I believe there's seven words that's destroying biblical Christianity and old-time religion. Seven words. Here, here they are. I don't see anything wrong with that. You can open the Bible and you can go through all of the verses and you can show without a shadow of a doubt that something is wrong in this day and age and a, and a person will sit there and listen to you and listen to you and listen to you and after you get done, they'll just say, well, I know, but I don't see anything wrong with that. Let's put that statement under the microscope. First of all, what's the first word? You know, anytime you start with I, you're in trouble. That's what got the devil kicked out of heaven. Don't start with I, start with God, start with his word. Don't see? Don't see? Doesn't this remind you of the book of Judges where everyone did what was right in his? Anything wrong with it? By the way, stop letting people put you on the defensive. You know what? Well, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? Turn it around on them. 
Open your King James Holy Bible and show me what's right with it. Because folks, we shouldn't be involved in something just because of the absence of a negative. There ought to be the overwhelming presence of a positive. We ought to know that it's right. Well, preach, I just believe there's gray areas. Well, you didn't grow up in Bob Ross's house. By the way, I don't think there's many gray areas as people want to say there's gray area. Because we not only have direct commandments, but we have Bible precepts and principles, umbrella Bible principles that help us with a lot of things. And I don't, I don't think there's as much gray as people want to, want to claim. But even if there is some gray, all right, instead of having a choice between black and white, I guess you got three choices now, black, gray, or white. Why wouldn't you still choose white? Why wouldn't you make sure that you're over here where it's safe? And isn't gray just a shade of black? Amen. If you go stand at the back door of a rock concert or a honky tonk, then you can go stand in the, in, near the front door of a church and there isn't a marked difference in the kind of music you're hearing coming from those places, then you've compromised. But thank God the story doesn't end there. We've got the fourth kind of a prophet and thank God for Elijah, the courageous prophet. He was there. I like that. Elijah, he said, behold, you tell Ahab, behold, Elijah is here. And there's some attributes of a courageous prophet that we need to recognize this morning. And folks, listen to me. You just need to be there. You just, let me say this, you need to stay there. Okay, every single community needs a man of God. Yeah, even rural America. Don't pass up rural America, young preachers. I believe every community in this nation needs some man of God to stand up with the King James Holy Bible and say, thus saith the Lord. Come on, somebody needs to do the marrying and the burying and the winning of souls in that community. We need preachers everywhere. We need men of God. I understand God moves people from time to time, but I'm wondering how many times we're moving ourselves. You come to a conference like this, you say, preach, I'm discouraged and I got problems and I got issues. Well, you're going to have those things at the next place too. Yeah, right. Amen. Don't let, a, don't let an Ahab run you off. Amen. Thank God for faithfulness. You young preachers, I'm just going to say this. You look around this auditorium and you, you, you see some of the gray heads and you meet some of these men. Come on now, it's been in the ministry for 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, some of them 60 years. Listen, young man, listen, you go over and shake that young, that man's hand because I'm going to tell you something, to stay in the ministry, by the way, shake his wife's hand also because he wouldn't have stayed in it if she hadn't stayed with him. Because I promise you in that length of a ministry, he had, he's had to walk past some quitting places. Every single one of us is going to have to come to a quit. We're going to come to some quitting places. And just, what, do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, it's places where it's just, it'd be easier just to quit and walk away than it would be to keep on keeping on. But thank God for you men that inspire me. I mean this, you inspire me because of your longevity and ministry and your faithfulness. And you dear ladies, God bless you. Thank you. Elijah was there. Elijah was filled and controlled by the Spirit of God. When he sent Obadiah to go find Ahab, he said, now, I don't know about this because I know you, Elijah. He said, as soon as I'm gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But, but I, thy servant, feared the Lord for my youth. And you know what, folks? Here's the compromising Come on, compromising prophet doing the bidding of a heathen king. But he knew Elijah did the bidding of the Spirit of God. And folks, listen to me. We need men of God that not only will just stay where they are, but they will be filled with the Spirit of God and they'll obey the Spirit of God. And listen, you stay true to this book and you listen to the Holy Spirit as he fine-tunes the direction of your ministry. And if the Holy Spirit is late, I want to say this because I think someone needs to hear it. The Holy Spirit has laid something on your heart to do. Listen to me. Don't question it. Step out by faith and do it. Step out by faith and do it. Elijah was willing to endure false accusations as soon as he meets Ahab. What comes out of Ahab's mouth? Verse 17, it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Ahab accusing Elijah. 
Think about that. Folks, we shouldn't be surprised when we're criticized. You stand for this book nowadays, and I'm going to tell you something, you're going to be called everything. You're going to be accused of everything. People in your community aren't going to understand. Several years ago, we were getting some Christmas baskets put together to take to some of our bus families and the bus captains. Their job was to get it delivered, and I showed up Christmas Eve at our, at our church, and there was two or three of these baskets and they hadn't gotten delivered. And they had the name, they had the address on it. And I thought, I'm not going to bother bus captains on Christmas Eve. I called one of the men in our church and said, hey, would you go with me real quick? I got three. And, and I'll be honest with you. I didn't have, the, Brother Hardin, I didn't have the best spirit about it. I, I really didn't want to be doing this on Christmas Eve. But I called the guy and I said, would you, would you run with me real quick? I, I don't want Christmas Eve and Christmas Day to pass without them getting these baskets. So we load them in the church van. And then we took off and we just made three quick stops. I'm at the very last one. I'm wanting to get home with my family. We pull in front of a trailer, there's a row of trailers, and, and, uh, and I get out of the church van. It says on the side of it, Blessed Oak Baptist Church. And I pick up this food basket. And he picks up, the, uh, up a, a, another one, a, a little fruit basket. And we head towards the door. About that time, there's a guy sitting in the church. Not the trailer we're going to take the food to, but right next door. And he's sitting there in a, in a lawn chair, and he's looking at us, and he looks at the van, and he looks at us, and he said, are you from Blessed Hope Baptist Church? I'm holding this food basket. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not on my spiritual A game right now, okay? And, and I, I looked at the van, I looked at him, and I wanted to say, yes, Cop Captain Obvious, I, yeah. No, we stole the van. And then we robbed a grocery store, and now we're just random. I said, but I didn't. I just said, yes, sir, we're from Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And then he said, well, I know about that church. Now, I always love this. I always love that there's people in the community that know more about my church than I do. He's never been there in his entire life, but he is an authority on Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And I said, pray tell. What do you know about Blessed Hope Baptist Church? And he said, I hear you run them red buses and you go around and pick up kids and then you take them downstairs in the basement, you tie them up and you beat them. <laughs> if I'm lying, I'm dying. God is my witness. I'm holding a food basket <laughs> that I'm delivering to poor people. And I looked at that guy and I thought to myself, I looked at the guy that was with me and I thought to myself and I said, sir, that is a blatant lie. I said, we do run buses and we do pick them up and we do take them in the basement, but we do not tie them up before we beat them. We give them a running start. <laughs> you say, you didn't say that. Yes, I did. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter what I say anyway. They're going to say what they're going to say, but I just didn't want the part in the paper about me you know, tying them up, you know. I thought, that sounds a little cruel, you know. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? If I spent my time trying to run around our community, putting out every silly little, listen, folks, listen, don't worry about what the world's saying. Don't worry about what the compromising preachers are saying about. You'll get more criticism, by the way, from so-called preachers and religious people than you will the world anyway. You know what, you get up every day and you make sure you have a good dis disposition and a walk with God and you love people and win souls and let the heathen rage and the wicked imagine a vain thing. Yes, right, you decide that you're going to be the true deal here. Elijah was there. He was controlled by the Spirit of God and he was willing to endure false accusations. Elijah was also willing to confront a wicked king. And folks, we've got to stand up against the sins of our, of our world. Folks, we have a pervert in the White House. I said we have a pervert in the White House. Come on. JFK in 1960 said, I will put a man on the moon. Biden says in 2023, I will put a man in every woman's bathroom. Come on, that's where we're at. Somebody told, said something to me in one of my Bible college classes I wrote down, I've never forgotten. The church should be the moral conscience of a community. The church should be the moral conscience of a community. 
We've got to take some stands that's very unpopular right now, but it's not time to go hide in the cave and, and go into the closet on these things. We need to stand up and call sin, sin. I want to say this about Elijah, and I'll close. Elijah was at his best when his nation needed him the most. Gentlemen, ladies, we need to be at our best right now because our nation needs us the most. You say, well, preacher, uh, if, I, if I be an Elijah, you know, uh, it may not work out. and There's no guarantees, and that's not popular anymore. Well, I want to just say this in closing. What kind of legacy are you going to leave behind when your time on this earth is done? We don't have the time to go there, but you go and find the three times Elijah's mentioned in the New Testament. When John the Baptist came preaching, you know what? Nobody said, you know what? You know who he reminds me of? Obadiah. <laughs> Brother, when a preacher showed up that would preach without fear and favor, you know what they said? That, I think that might be Elijah. Come on. When God needed to send somebody down, come on, to, to encourage and strengthen his son on the Mount of Transfiguration, he didn't say, oh, let's see, Moses and Obadiah. You know who got to go down? Somebody who had stood. Not the compromiser, the courageous prophet. He's the one that ended up on the Mount of Transfiguration beside Jesus. When God led James to give an example of fervent, effectual prayer, come on, he didn't say, he didn't call the names of any of those cave boys. He called the name of Elijah. Now folks, listen to me. You're, you're going to have to decide for you and I'm going to have to decide for me and that's what makes it great about being an independent fundamental Baptist. Amen. I'm going to go home and do my thing you go home and do your thing. But before God, we need to look in the mirror Say, am I a counterfeit? Come on, am I a coward? Am I a compromiser? And if you are, you know what, folks, it's time to stand. Because, listen, the enemy's gathering on top of the mountain. And somebody's got to walk up the top of the mountain and confront it. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this godly example of this godly man. One of my Bible heroes. Thank you for a daddy that was an Elijah. Thank you that all of my Bible heroes and my preacher heroes have always been Elijahs. And Lord, I, I just want to thank you, dear God, and ask that you give me the strength and the courage, oh God, please, that no matter what the cost is, Lord, that I would always stand as an Elijah stood. Lord, don't let me go coward. Don't let me be a compromiser. God forbid I'd ever join the counterfeiters. Lord, help us to be courageous in this day and age. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.